podcast. I think we're up to number 24, uh, which completely astounds me as I didn't think we'd have enough to talk about for, for that many weeks. So it's kind of a milestone for us and we hope uh, that we'll have much more information for you over coming weeks and we thank you for joining us and uh, taking part through uh, listening to our podcast. Uh, This is uh, a series that we hope will be of interest to artists and art lovers alike and we generally just want to talk about different aspects of the the painting uh, idea and what it takes for an artist to go out and do a painting and what the rest of us who uh, can't aspire to paint uh, can can look for in a painting. Obviously, I'm beginning to babble at this point. I've only had one cup of coffee this morning, so we're going to jump in uh, fairly quickly and, and talk with uh, our, uh, our usual uh, compadres here, uh, Lawin Connie Nagel and David P. Curtis, who have just been up in Maine. They've just returned um, from a workshop up there. Uh, conducting a workshop and Connie's been doing a lot of painting so hopefully they will have lots of sight and insight to share with you about their experiences Uh, and so without further ado let's get right into our topic of the week which is copying from the masters Uh, I this uh, this idea these days brings out a lot of um, debate as to whether copying from the masters is uh, something that isn't as good, that you shouldn't be copying somebody else's ideas. On the other hand, it was a time-honoured way of enhancing your own skills as a student by copying artists who have stood the test of time. And so we're going to be talking to David and Connie about this idea. Uh, David conducts a copying from the Master's Workshop at Rockport Art Association and Museum. He's been doing it for a number of years uh, and students copy from paintings taken from the um, permanent collection at the uh, Rockport Art Association. Uh, and so, um, without further ado, David, let's go to you. Do you think that the idea of copying from the masters, obviously you're teaching a workshop, so it's obviously something that you think is an acceptable idea for, for students to learn more of the craft? Yeah, oh, yeah, definitely, uh, yes. And, and we all know the history of it. It, it was time honored. I think nowadays the and of course around the the time of the uh, uh, turn of the century into the eighteenth and nineteenth century, you had a big revolution in art with uh, David wanting to go back to more of an academic way of learning and educating people, which is very popular to this day with the Barg system and things like that. Prior to that, I believe most museums and most manners of uh, learning to uh, to. Uh, learning to become a professional artist, uh, we're copying, we're from copying. So it was a time-honored <laughs> tradition, very valuable. Uh, and I do know what you said in the introduction, copying seems to freak people out these days. If you, uh, uh, you oh, you can't copy, you can't copy. And um, yet that's how, that's really, I think, the essence of learning from a master. And if you want to be a painter, and it's one thing to the academic tradition really teaches you fine manners in uh, how to understand drawing um, in tradition in certain academic traditions and whatever. Um, but painting can be very particular unto itself with all the varied mm-hmm. surfaces that you can create, uh, all the different techniques and manners in which it can be expressed in. Um, so why not when you go to a museum, you walk around, you say, oh. This is beautiful. I think I go to a museum, either I walk out the door at the end being thoroughly depressed that I can never be as good as they are, or uplifted that maybe there's hope (laughs) that I can paint something that would be as good as what they do. Mm -hmm. So I've always had a reaction. So the next question would be, if I get a reaction from looking at a a, a Rembrandt or a Velasquez or Monet or whatever the painting would be, um, why shouldn't I study it and learn more Mm -hmm. about the painting? Um, so, uh, so what you're looking for when you when you're copying a painting? Are you looking for um, maybe maybe kind of this question should uh, come to you when you're copying a painting? I know you've done some recently. Mm-hmm. Um, are you looking for how the original artist painted it? The, the type of brush stroke, the the color, the texture, what number brush he uh, he <laughs> or she used? <laughs> how how important is all that technical stuff? I think some of that is is 
important. I, I think what excites me about copying a master painting is, is the idea that I set out my paints, my palette, and then I, I see what key this person has keyed. Like I recently did a Monet, and it was the Grand Canal in the, Venice. At the Museum of Fine Arts in the, in Boston. Yes, at the yeah. MFA Boston. And, um, and you go up, you have to go through a whole process of uh, being cleared, permitted, and then the curator of the European Gallery came, met me at the front door with my supplies, um, and and stamped my canvas before I went up to to the Monet room. And um, you have to have a, a four foot square drop cloth, you know, but uh, underneath you, um, set up uh, a certain distance from the piece. Mm -hmm. um, I really wanted to do another one of the Monets, but it was in the corner. She said that, uh, you know, the tourists, the people that are the gallery walkers uh, would not be able to move around me very easily. So, so they wanted to put me in a certain place in the, mm -hmm. in the room. Um, I think it's fascinating to, to paint um, actually in a museum. This was the first time I'd ever done it. I had headphones, which I strongly recommend if you if you do go to paint a master painting in in the museum because people are constantly moving around you. Um, I didn't have my headphones on, and so I could hear what people were saying. Mm -hmm. And this one woman must have had a group of people with her, and she was standing right behind me, and she said, "Now this lady is doing uh, an age old tradition." She's painting a master painting. And, um, but, but to answer your question about what it is that moves me or that I get um, captured by, it's the brush strokes, it's the color, color palette or the range in which that person is, is um, you know, um, creating this image. Uh, and it is... Um, a certain sense of excitement when you're actually in that process. Uh, so I think so that's maybe... Do you think then is the inspiration to produce a painting, is the same excitement there if you're doing something straight from nature and being on location on a beautiful day and the birds are singing, compared with painting from a master in a museum where... It's you know well, it's, I, it's a painting, but which, which is is it different? I I think uh, painting is about learning. Mm -hmm. Nobody just paints for uh, let's say to get their master's degree in art. Okay, I'm done. I'm graduated. Now I can go out and be a businessman. You know. Um, so what what are you what are you doing here? You, it's a lifelong pursuit of learning. If you're not learning and pursuing, I I think I don't think art means anything to you in the sense of wanting to create it. So I think you're constantly learning. It's all part of that education. So I think the fascination of painting is also the fascination of learning. So to me, it's hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Plus, that if you copied a, a great painting, uh, right. you, you, you would learn so much of that that would be so fascinating. I just don't have the gumption to go into a museum like Connie <laughs> does and set up in front of people and do it. And I and uh, she was not willing to talk about how good she is. But the, these when I saw the Monet, I said, that's a Monet. <laughs> you know, the, the uh -huh. key, the brush strokes, beautifully done, beautifully done. Yeah. I think, I think too... Um, going out in nature, you're in, a, there's a life force that's there. There's a life force in these original paintings. Mm -hmm. Unlike if you drew, you know, if you got it on the internet and you put it up on a monitor and you're, mm -hmm. tra you're kind of copying that monitor, that flat screen or uh, print of the piece, um, is rather dead to me. Yeah. But these are living images, and um, it is distracting to have people walking around you, but 
you again, it's the same sort of thing as if you were a plain air artist and you were set up on the street. Oh, no, the double you know? are coming past. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and they're all wanting to to kind of look <laughs> and some doing? <laughs> and some even oh, yeah. want to stop and talk. Yeah, and uh, it was true also at the museum. If I a- accidentally touched, you know, caught eyes with somebody, mm. there was a man who I I stepped back from my easel. And I looked over, and he caught my eye, and then he said, I want to take your photo. <laughs> and I said, oh, sure, 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 you know. <laughs> but um, but I think you, uh, I, I tried to look down, and I think um, it's interesting because I, I used to be um, into uh, Buddhist meditation where I'd go and you'd sit in a pagoda for 10 days. And uh, <laughs> But the criteria, why I bring this up is one of the criteria at the outset was that you would not look at people and you keep your eyes down. Mm-hmm. And so I learned a lot about avoiding so, eye contact with people. Sounds like a cold cream guard. Right? <laughs> yeah. Well, not a cold stream guard, mind you. Yeah, it's a cold yeah. cream guard. Yeah. So what you're saying is it's important to study um, meditation before you actually go into <laughs> It a sounds meeting. like that's what I'll have to do <laughs> because I, 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 I'd be too nervous yeah. in a museum. Uh, and I, and you, you, the idea of copying from a photograph or a book or things like that versus the thing that's alive. Doesn't, but it is, doesn't interest no. you to copy um, from a photograph. The reason why I started yeah. copying the master's class at Rockport was because I did a still life class for years. And the lighting was so bad. And every student would say, David, the lighting, the lighting. Um, And Rockport Art Association is a beautiful skylight gallery. Um, But everybody turns on the artificial lights. Uh, And so when I realized that if we hung up the collection pieces and left a lot of space so people could really spend time copying, three days in a row to copy a painting, um, that with with the yellow lights off, these were mostly uh, painters who in the direct painting method, uh, mm. like you know you you put it down like impressionism, which is put it down, plain which air is exa- and it's yeah. exactly what yeah. you'd want to do. Copying it is to be able to not put it down in, in layers um, mm-hmm. or um, you know bistering the paint one layer over another, but paint it as you see it. So yeah. some people um, some people are really really good at this copying uh, the master's class. And not only do they learn something about the history, the artist, because they're studying about the artist, but in your case, you know a little bit about this. They understand the psyche of the individual who might have painted it. Well, I think um, I'm also drawn to paint the masters because I feel like I enter into their world psychologically. So you're right. I have this feeling, and, and that's a draw for me. That's a real excitement because it almost seems like I did a Hibbert. Um, and um, I felt as if I was experiencing how Hibbert paints. He paints quite differently from Monet, at least in my, mm-hmm. in my uh, feeling state <laughs> of it. Um, he's, he's more... Um, also, he used... Uh, he used more muted colors, more earth, uh, not earth tones, but he mixed the colors in a in a very different way. Um, and of course, his key was very different. It was more of a mid tone as opposed to a, a high note, like a soprano mm-hmm. note, with the Monet. Um, but that is something that I like. I like entering into the the uh, master painter's world. Yeah, very, and and you do you you come away with the style that the individual had, the interpretation that the individual had. You're able to render that yeah. pretty closely the way it is, um, and you always do a great job in that master's okay. class. You always, uh, I think, really understand that. But how important it is, and it's kind of a shame that this stigma that copying is wrong. I mean, uh, I was in an atelier as a student, and uh, one of the things we had to do was the, and and being in an atelier almost is significant of the fact that we can trace the understanding and the sort of the knowledge and even parts of the technique all the way back to the Renaissance. And um, so it was traditional that um, in the uh, Gamel's atelier that we had to copy a master. 
Um, and uh, even entering Gamble's Atelier, my idea of a master was uh, William Turner or William Blake, uh, <laughs> who were my sort of favorite painters before I met Mr. Gamble. And I've uh, really instilled to me that the, the, the you know, why, why look up to a, to a um, you know, just, a, just an average uh, artist when you can look up to the greatest? And of course, that makes more sense. And I still have my affection for William Turner to this day <laughs> and, uh, and William Blake. But nonetheless, I had to draw a copy of a, and I chose a Raphael drawing. And as I copied it, I could not get anywhere with the whole understand, just a pencil copy. Uh, and one of the senior students came along and said, oh, David, you're doing a copy. Um, you having trouble? Why don't you just trace it? Copy it, you know, trace it, actually. I wasn't even going to copy it, I was going to trace it. And I thought, oh, you can't do that. You can't trace. He said, no, seriously, you'll learn a lot by doing that. Mm -hmm. And I traced his, and, and the, the amount of education, the variety of that line that Raphael had on the edge of his arm was, was just amazing, let alone the understanding of the anatomy that was there, too. But it was that, just that beautiful line that he had constructed, and it wasn't until I traced it. And I would actually said if, if one of my boys were, when they were younger, growing up, and said, teach me to draw, I think I might say to them, draw Leonardo, da just copy, trace Leonardo da Vinci's drawings, uh, Raphael's drawings, and Michelangelo's drawings. Just keep on tracing them over and over. And then, okay, now see what you can do. And I think the memory of those proportions in that understanding that those masters had about the human figure, figure uh, must have been tremendous. Right. But, yeah, uh, yeah this uh, stigma you know, of copying is, mm -hmm. is odd, I think. It is interesting that uh, um, when I was reading about copying the masters, Rubens copied Titian. Okay. Van Dyck uh, also copied. Sargent copied Velasquez. Exactly. And I didn't even... <laughs> and it's, it's curious because... Uh, David was bringing up this guy, Mars, who was uh, painted by Velasquez. And he said, okay, who painted this? And I thought it was Sargent. So <laughs> it's kind of curious that Sargent copied Velasquez, yeah. Yeah. you know. And, and, uh, and these people actually went in and copied these mm. pieces in the Louvre and other places. Um, and these are famous painters. I mean, obviously, you know. Yeah, uh, but I suppose they had to start somewhere as well. And yeah. And I think we wouldn't have had the appreciation for Velasquez almost being reborn at that turn of the century uh, by by some of the Impressionists who were starting to recognize uh, a and whole perhaps, different yeah. technique yeah. and style in Velasquez. And who's who are these academic painters complaining about if we're admiring somebody who's even greater than they are. Yeah. And his and they understood that it was all optics. But the amazing thing was that this Velescus of Mars uh, had that that unity that the Impressionists all strove for. And uh, he just did it as a court artist. And interesting that it, it, Velescus being the court Spanish court artist to Philip went over to uh, Rubens, who was elderly at the time, and any advice? He said, go to Rome and copy the Titians. And, wow. and Velescus went there. And Velescus's work, if you can really see the difference between before he went and then when he returned, really? a wow. big difference uh, in his work. And the, the figures were, I think, like you could say, fused more together. It's Les Meninas. That you've mm -hmm. seen, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, is is just that masterful painting of of visual, um, and most of the Boston school artists. I think uh, when Hibbard won the traveling scholarship, mm -hmm. one of the things he did do was to travel to the Alhambra, and mm -hmm. uh, in Spain and see and copy parts of the. I think it was the weavers, right? Yeah. Um, wow. in, in sections of it, uh, because they were great admirers mm -hmm. of that, uh, mm -hmm. but. Um, and I think that's interesting because it, if Velasquez led him to be go to the Alhambra, that's where he did his first landscapes of mountains that he, I think, fell in love with. Yeah, yeah, yeah was yeah. painting the mountains because, in yeah, Spain. Yeah, he was from Cape Cod originally, so yeah. you know suddenly he could see this dramatic terrain and and how once you're high up, you, you get a completely different perspective, and mm -hmm. uh, you know the air is more rarefied, and so you obviously the distance must look. 
different to how it would if you're if you're down at sea level. Yeah. So yes, it was a big influence on him. The, Pity he couldn't stay there for the full two years of his scholarship, but because the mm. war broke out, he had to leave mm. and come home mm. early. I was going to also say that um, Cezanne um, said that. Um, I mean, a quote that I that I found uh, when I was looking up copying masters uh, is that the Louvre is the book from which we learn to read. And he said, um, when you practiced uh, painting uh, the best works um, you can find uh, from the hand of a great master, you've done well. So yeah. it's, yes. it's yeah. really... Um, I think that's fantastic. Cool. Uh, the other thing is that I just uh, that the that there are three places that have copy programs. One is the Met at the in New York. One's the National Gallery of Art in Washington, and then the third one is the Louvre. Uh, but that doesn't mean that other museums don't have that. Like for instance, the MFA Boston. Is al- allows you to come in and copy, but they don't want to tell people. <laughs> but they're not telling, and they also don't have a if program. If you inquire yeah. specifically, yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Can I ask this question? The the probably the argument to this, I'm going to take mm-hmm. the opposite side, which would be, um, you know, copying somebody else's painting does you no good. Okay, maybe you learn a little bit, but it's not your own work. Now, you not only copy well, but you do go out and do landscapes. And um, do you feel that the, this, the difference between doing something of all your own or something copying from somebody else, uh, that there's, is there a difference? Is it a similarity? I think that the copying informs you and gives you more permission to experiment on site. So what I find is that I be, have become much more of a daring pa- painter. Mm. You know, it's like I get on site and I am not so squeamish about putting the paint on or uh, or even having accidents or uh, supposedly accidents. Um, I realize that um, that these masters were also doing somewhat of the same thing. They were putting it on some thickly they were they were making um, corrections constantly in their paintings uh, things like that are happening so it it allows you to be much more forgiving you know and and gentle I think to yourself as an artist so I think I think and uh, the proof is that this last week I was out painting uh, landscape paintings all week long and I um, I went on site and I would immediately find a, uh, a situation set up and commit myself to the whole thing I wouldn't sit there and go ah, maybe the, to the left it's better you know um, I used to always question my my um, commitment to to a particular mm-hmm. site so I, I think it's really helped me tremendously. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, and I think you did have a good week. I thought a lot of interesting designs. Yeah. Uh, compositions, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, and um, it was very nice to get away up there. Beautiful area to paint. Um, I wish I could have painted. I did a few demonstrations, but they were never finished enough. Uh, but it was, uh, it was a very, very talented group of students. And um, I, th- I think they were very appreciative of the fact that... Uh, the weather, was, you know, a good workshop is the weather is halfway decent. Nobody yeah. cursed me for the weather. David, your weather in your workshops is no good. <laughs> right. So I got good reports on the weather. Excellent. David, you had an excellent workshop. The weather was good. So, well, just coming back to the idea of, um, of going into museums and, and copying uh, I was just going to interject a thought here of something that Connie had had found from the Florence Academy of Art, which was founded 1991 by Daniel Graves. I think you know Dan? Yes, yeah. friend of uh, um, Chuck Caesar. Yeah, so, uh, and his thought was, when Connie mentioned that there were only uh, two or three places that sort of have set programmes where you can go and copy, um, and Dan Graves' opinion was that... Um, uh, it, 
that we have to remind museum directors that they are the custodians of public heritage and so have a duty to make their collections accessible mm. to painters. And I think that's kind of an interesting idea that, you know, the mm. museums are there. They're not just there for people to go in and look at some nice pictures and then maybe have a meal at the cafe. That They're there for, you know, the museums were created in order for students to be able to go in and, and to learn from from these uh, painters and because they have stood the test of time over hundreds of years obviously these mm. these are people who are worth looking to to see how they did something yes, and to yeah. learn from that method and, and it's a shame i think the museums have become sort of this um you know rather than a school we'll say a museum mm. school in which students would learn to paint inside the museum uh, they've become something of uh, large fundraisers, and you know nothing wrong with that. But one of the debates that's very contemporary now is about lighting, and uh, what museums are doing about lighting, and how museums are defending the idea that there should be no daylight in museums because it's damaging the paintings, and they can prove <laughs> it's kind of a shame. And years ago, I think most museums had artists on their on their boards. Uh, to advise them about the, the aesthetics of the museum uh, and also the purpose of it. Uh, nowadays, it's probably fundraising, and it's kind of a shame that they don't get the artist's input in this. And one of the things uh, that I, I think is this debate going on about we need more natural light or is natural light damaging the creative art, you know. Um, and certainly we saw that in the, in the workshop. Everybody did wonderful paintings outdoors, but when we brought them indoors for the critique, <laughs> that was interesting. Every, most of our critiques really all week long were out of doors, and then when they all brought them indoors and you had the yellow lights, <laughs> it, it sort of darkened everything, and you know, well, how come my painting is so dark? But, um, so this, there is that big debate about natural light and artificial light. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. did you didn't have to take special lighting, and when you went to work at the MFA, you had to work under whatever lighting right. conditions in whatever the Whatever conditions are there, yeah. and uh, yeah, and and I think in some ways that's kind of grueling, and it probably doesn't fit every artist's personality. Yeah, because I, it strikes me that some of some museum lighting these days is sort of subdued, so that you. Yeah, yeah. You're sort of working in the dark part of the time. Yeah. You know, the other thing I was I was thinking of that um, that happens when you when you do paint a, a master painting, um, you find things, and sometimes you find things in the painting that people haven't even noticed or seen. <laughs> and um, it happened with the Hibbard painting. When I was painting that, I saw mm -hmm. that there was a little man That's there. That's right, yeah. The, and nobody, uh, else had nobody had noticed for years, <laughs> decades, decades. Yeah, decades. Yeah, decades. Yeah, 20, yeah. 30 years. You know, but it was... And somebody who says he's a good paint, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, so when I, I think, was that piece that you did of the Hibbard, was that slightly larger than the original? Mine was, uh, yeah. the Hibbert was a 9 by 12, mine was a 12 16. Okay, so when, when you're painting or when you're copying... Yeah, that's um, another important... It's, you're not supposed to copy these things sight size. No. No. Um, no. Is that, does that make it harder to, to make a copy because you've got to do it at a different it size? It shouldn't. But Maybe I, you're cropping yeah. it a bit or whatever, but... Uh, no, that's the regulations, normal regulations, is the size cannot duplicate the size of the yeah. image. And, but, you yeah. know, I guess that's the way. I mean, I think the business of art nowadays, yes, you, is a lot of probably, uh, so copying a painting and then reselling it uh, is, is fine. As, as far as I've ever seen in the research, there's nobody who has, um, you know, might have a copyright, but most museums, it's... Mm -hmm. it's uh, it's not copyrighted, so the when you make a copy, it's copyrighted for reproductions. And the difference, Connie pointed out, the difference between the original and a copy. I don't know how many times my uh, my brother's in visiting was at the Tate today, and I just said, "What did you think of the sergeant?" You know, <laughs> in the Tate, the uh, Lily, Lily, uh, Carnation, yeah. yeah. And uh, he said, "Wow, 
it's so big, <laughs> you know, because when you see it reproduced yeah, in you books, don't you say, pictures, it, yeah. maybe it's a, a 1620 or something, <laughs> but this is an enormous painting, <laughs> figures life size, beautiful. Oh, uh, and the subtleties, <laughs> the subtleties never show up in a reproduction, mm. you know. And that's, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, have you ever tried copying from just a photograph? I mean, uh, no, you know, not really. Another, uh, yeah, no, yeah. never. It's totally different. Uh, but I can't imagine. It, I don't think that you can get that um, because because you can't see the undulations, the different uh, brush stroke, the texture, the surface, the yeah. surface. Yeah, yeah you yeah, can't yeah, see yeah. the surface. Yeah. Um, something I was going to mention. Um, I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, I have the same problem. I'm scribbling notes down and I can't read them. Um, all right, just so uh, before we uh, we finally uh, close up, um, I know you mentioned the comment. Does every brush stroke count? Hmm. Um, do you think that when you're when you're doing your own work, obviously you're putting the brush strokes you think you need to you know for the painting to reproduce the scene in front of you. If you're copying something, do you notice that? The, the strokes are all necessary. There are certain... Nothing's in there that it shouldn't be. Yeah. I would say... Oh, I, I, and I remember what I was going to say is that I, um, when I copied the Anthony Serino, it was a square like, mm -hmm. um, like a 30 by 34 or something like that. And, um, and I did a 24-36, a rectangle. And I mm -hmm. wanted to do that because I thought... That the piece would look better. Yeah, and um, yes, it did. <laughs> and <laughs> and so, I think that you, what you're doing is there's a copying element to this. But I think if you're a slave to copying the piece, mm -hmm. you know, per se, just like it is, just uh, um, what you know, brushstroke for brushstroke. Uh, I'm not sure that you're catching the tenor of the piece, you know, the, the feeling nature of the piece. Um, I think that when you're, you're crafting it, you say, well, in my mind, this would look better as a rectangle versus a square. I'm going to do a rectangle. I'm going to spread it out of the piece and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. That that's uh, kind of your artistic license, as David would say. Mm -hmm. You know, you take your artistic license out and you use it. Um, and um, and that brushstroke, uh, every brushstroke counts, but counts not uh, as, a, as a copying, well, at least in, in talking about the copying, the masters, it's not that every brushstroke counts because you've, you've done it just like the master had produced it, but that you're doing it consciously, mm -hmm. I think, to create a um, a replica of what you think this this what the feeling that you got from the piece. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think feelings are most pronounced in these pieces, and you want to replicate that. Yeah, yeah. Any last thoughts from you, Dave, before we have to say goodbye? No, I, I think uh, I think if you go out and you uh, go to a museum, get permission, and uh, copy a, a painting of your choice, uh, I think that it would it, if you have the gumption to do it. I, I think it's rough to have a crowd of people watching you paint uh, anyway. But um, it, as you said, it happens outdoors if you're mm -hmm. outdoors painting. So no, I think you you would learn a lot from uh, a painter, any painter that you would admire. Mm -hmm. uh, in so many ways, as I said, the, the tactile qualities of that painting, uh, some of the most important parts are in the tactile quality, the surface of the painting. And I think when you're right next to the painting, you can observe that much finer than from a, uh, an image. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, it's been great getting back to uh, the microphone and hearing all about your thoughts on uh, all things art. Uh, we certainly need more of it in our lives these days. Uh, I've spent an angst-filled week dealing with the cat and various other problems, and it's so nice just to uh, sit back and think about a piece of art because somehow you can lose yourself in that mm -hmm. and think you, you get a sort of more peaceful mood out of it. <laughs> uh, however, and so on, on that note, uh, I'm going to say if you've enjoyed this, I hope you'll uh, sit back and then press that follow button on the website so that you don't miss uh, another upcoming episode from us. 
Uh, and we're always glad to hear any comments that you might want to send us about what we've been talking about or something that you'd like us to discuss. So uh, come on and let's hear from you. Uh, and before we go, here is my last thought for the day, which is a quote from R.H.I.S. Gamble, who uh, David loves to quote, and who does the accent much better than I do. So I think the quote was, a near Vermeer is a mere veneer. <laughs> which, if I've said it correctly, um, perhaps says it all. So anyway, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Very good, very good. Thanks. <laughs>